So 30 years ago is uh, Jack, what's 30 years ago? Jack Dolan? 1987. I'm done. Uh, but uh, I want to thank the committee uh, who stayed with us so long. I name you all. I'm hitting something. Uh, but I want to thank the ones who are here tonight. Um, thank you for coming. Doctor, thank you for coming tonight. If you give us a moment, we're going to have a few uh, introductory uh, remarks about my father, and then we'll go to the lecture. Marianne? I'm Marianne Dolan, John Hill's only sister. <laughs> Thanks to all, and especially Dr. Nordstrom, thank you for coming. Deep gratitude also to the doctors who created and supported the Dolan Lecture for all these years. A lot of them are in the room this evening. There, a lot have moved on and are no longer with us. I think particularly of Ken Haggerty. There are a slew of Dolans here as well, and uh, one late arrival, uh, as usual. Uh, and that would please the old man tremendously. Uh, in, in addition to Brother John, his wife Carol, who has worked behind the scenes on the lecture for many years, and they're sitting up here with their son, Jack, the marvelous Jack Dolan. Stand up so they can see it. Okay. Uh, Bill's children, Tom, the tall one here, uh, are, is a regular lecturerite and Kathleen, about to fill one of those seats, my guess would be, on her way here from work is, is another. You'll know her by her exquisite beauty. Uh, Bill Three, sitting over here, um, uh, with and his pal Jean sitting not over there, but there. Jean Statler, a great supporter of the hospital um, uh, and a great friend of mine. Um, you know Bill, he was a trustee of the hospital for many years and um, now is more known for his role as Pop, the grandfather to Tom and Mary Ellen's three children, Hannah, Nora, and Fitz, who are, because of their wise mother, not here tonight. <laughs> so just as Daddy's belief in ongoing medical education is the core of the Dolan lecture. So too was it at the heart of Dolan family life. As you know, our mother had been a nurse, the beautiful Christine Shea Dolan, RN, and often hinted to me what a wonderful career it would make for me. But for his part, I think Daddy envisioned white lab coats on each of his three children from the time we could walk. We were not particularly good at fulfilling that dream, but the, this hospital was surely a big part of our general overall education, and education is why we're all gathered. We were around these halls a lot growing up. A few glimpses. John, still in short pants with suspenders, toddles one Sunday afternoon into the pregnancy testing room. It was just down the hall from Daddy's office. Wow, Wonderland, he thinks. It is lined with cozy cages of small white mice doing their diagnostic duty. Swiftly and determinedly, John proceeds to open every cage door and let the cute little white guys out to play. <laughs> Bedlam follows. Bill, on the other hand, was expected as the eldest to be the man, spending hours with his father on the other side of Dr. Dolan's iconic two-way teaching microscope, and keeping step with his dad's pre-med at any age educational program, he is in the morgue. Lots of morgue time. Autopsies, anatomy tutorials, Bill's only go-to playmate in those years being morgue assistant, the hilariously laconic Harold Alexander. You remember him, Don? <laughs> As for my challenge, it was the summer after I graduated from high school, a sort of internship program personally supervised by Daddy, and put together with Verve by those wonderful lab techs 
he always called the girls in the lab. <laughs> Disney, Dorothy, Scotty, the rest of them, they were a legendary team. I was shuttled from department to department, jobs in the administrator's office, joyfully morning moments in the baby, wor in the baby ward, daddy's favorite daily stop, pipette duty in urology, chart taking in the ER. My ultimate moment, however, was the day Dr. Dolan gruffly handed me my own white coat and told me to follow him. I was to witness his gathering of a bone marrow specimen. Right out of General Hospital, we were circled around the prone body in the procedures room. Daddy, washed, gloved, hatted, was presented with his tool, a sharply pointed drill in those days. As it penetrated the patient's chest bone, the gentleman began to slowly rise up At, as the drill point went in and as daddy proceeded, he rose further. And as he rose up, I went down. <laughs> <laughs> On the floor, cold pass out, end of Mary Ann Dolan's medical career. <laughs> but there was no end to listening and learning from daddy's passion to understand current sci science and medical practice, and to try to see where these could be advanced to fight disease. 1977, I'm privileged to be in Chicago with him for the burning of the mortgage for the new Center for Continuing Education built by the American Society of Clinical Pathologists, which he would serve as president. He had been the central fundraiser and major cheerleader for the center, an effort which started with $691 in the bank and built to $8 million, plus the hefty matching grants he helped secure from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. It was a center wholly devoted to advanced education in clinical pathology. 1984, my breakfast room in Los Angeles, where I am by now working at, on a Los Angeles newspaper, I have two house guests, Dick Palmer, chief pathologist at Alexandria Hospital and president of the American Medical Association, many of you knew him well, uh, and Daddy, chairman of the AMA Council on Scientific Affairs. As best friends, they could be sitting in the sunshine talking about many of the fun interests they shared, football, baseball, hunting, cigars, family, the Super Bowl game between the Redskins and the LA Raiders, which we were about to attend. But for at least three hours before we left for that game, they sit and talk instead about AIDS. It is the scourge that has been officially declared an epidemic in the U.S. in 1981, and these doctors are heavily involved in understanding its challenges and ramifications. They are envisioning the systems which will have to be developed to totally revamp and protect our blood supplies. They will stay with that cause. Daddy will become president of the American Association of Blood Banks. Much will change. And in 1988, actually, Dr. Anthony Fauci will deliver the first Dolan Lecture on Progress Against AIDS in the United States. It all comes together here at this lecture, so appropriately chosen as a way to remember our father. Not long before Daddy died in 1999, Bill asked him this question. If you were to begin a career in medicine today, what would be your interest? Without hesitation, Daddy answered, immunology. Understanding more about how the immune system could be put to work for us was, he believed, the next key to the future. And, as we heard at last year's outstanding presentation by Dr. Michael Atkins, immuno immunotherapy is indeed the bright light in our battle against cancer and probably other diseases. So now let's take a look at a brief history of the Dolan Lecture, put together by Dory Kellner and Amy Stern and the video team. And then we'll hear from Dr. Nordstrom on another most current and future medical and social challenge. So roll film, Dory. It's up to you.
I know Dr. Dolman from the day that I was a third year med student at Georgetown in 1970, and he was the pathologist at the hospital, uh, chief of staff. So when I started my clinical rotations, he was the man. He started the whole show. He was committed and driven and loved his work and knew everybody. There was something went wrong on the OBGYN service. And he called me and he said, uh, go over there and find out what it is and take care of it. And I said, I have no training in OBGYN. I said, I don't know the first thing about it. He said, you're a doctor, aren't you? Back in 1990, I had this very complex patient who needed hospitalization but had no insurance. I wanted her to forego the six hour delay in the emergency department because she was in great pain. And so I went to Dr. Dolan and asked him how I was gonna get around this. And he said, if we can't take care of the sick and the needy in this place, what the hell are we doing? He's uh, an icon, in my opinion, of Virginia Hospital Center. And I think without him and these lectures, this hospital would not be as good as it is because they are practicing state-of-the-art medicine. And I don't think that could have happened without him. It was later that I learned that it was Dr. Dolan who you know, years and years ago had really formulated this plan to bring residents from the university hospital setting to community hospitals because community hospital scenes and experiences were completely different than the university setting. The dynamics of medicine are unbelievable and we're on the verge of some very significant changes. When those changes take place other things will appear so you have to maintain the contact with the field and have a place where there's an opportunity for people to present new information and new data. What's happening right now? What, is, what should we be learning together? What should we be talking about? Who is the best in the nation to come and talk to us? And the list of those speakers has been really tremendous. For example, one of the lecturers was the world expert on breast cancer. He came to us from Italy to give the lecture. And, and some people locally uh, in his field said, oh, why, well, why didn't you ask us? But we weren't the world expert. But I think one of the most important things is the following day, we'll have the lecturer give a revision of the lecture to the students and the residents from Georgetown and to other faculty members or uh, community, mem community doctors that could not make it. And that is such an important piece of the teaching part of what Dr. Dolan wants to always enable this hospital to be. Again, its charter was to be an informative medical lecture for physicians. That's how it started off and we've modified that to include the community as well as physicians so that it was of, of great interest to the physician however would also draw in the local Arlington community. Well, I think the vision of this lecture was really to say what would Bill do if he were here? Who would Bill Dolan invite to speak? And I think uh, the lectures that have been delivered have been wonderful. They've been inspirational. And honestly, they're Bill Dolan reaching forward. I think Dr. Dolan's vision for this lecture series was really to bring this small suburban hospital into high levels of academic engagement. This lecture series for the last 30 years has really accomplished that mission. Well, anything that lasts 30 years in today's world, particularly in regard to medicine, I think speaks for itself. I mean, medicine has evolved enormously in the last 30 years and this is still going on and so I would hope that the medical community and the community at large would take advantage of this and continue to attend these lectures. I think this was Dr. Dolan's legacy. This education process would continue on after he left us and, uh, and that's the way it's worked out. That His influence is still there.
Hi, I'm Patrick Correnti. Um, it's funny, when we were doing this video, I was asked, uh, you know, what did you learn from Dr. Dolan? Uh, well, I started practice in 1998, and Dr. Dolan died in 1999, and uh, I was the last physician to take care of Dr. Dolan, which was interesting <laughs> um, and a lot of fun. But um, what I had learned, as the uh, was pointed out earlier, was the legacy that Dr. Dolan left behind in terms of starting this hospital and actually bringing the residents over to uh, the community hospital from the university setting, which was so important because I know Christina Basavlis here uh, from my class, but from my class alone from Georgetown, uh, when we finished residency, there was about 15 of us that ended up coming to Arlington Hospital, uh, now Virginia Hospital Center. And uh, that's always been a huge pull for this community hospital from Georgetown and some from G a lot from GW also, but Georgetown primarily because of the bond that we've had. Um, so the legacy of the programs that, uh, that Dr. Dolan had set up so many years ago are still so strong and the teaching that goes on here is so amazing. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to teach the, the students and residents and fellows that come over here uh, on a daily basis. Um, in November of 1997, um, I had started talking to Dr. Ryan about joining his practice, and uh, it was I was informed that I needed to meet Dr. Dolan in order to potentially join this committee. And so he trudged me over to Dr. Dolan's office, who shared an office with Dr. Nolan. So it was Dr. Nolan, Dr. Dolan, and Dr. Ryan. So here I felt I was being a little attacked by the Irish Mafia. <laughs> so Dr. Dolan in his later years said, well, how do you spell that last name of yours? And I said, well, it's Correnti. And after the second R, his pen tend to rant out. And he looks at me and goes, is that Italian? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's Italian. I said, but my first name's Patrick, so I'm half Irish. <laughs> well, I guess that'll do. So um, I got to be involved in the lecture committee. So my first meeting of the lecture was Dr. Dolan, Dr. Nolan, Dr. O'Regan, Dr. Haggerty, and thank God there was Dr. Gatos, the token Italian on the, uh, the committee. Um, but it was a very fun committee, and we got along great. And uh, uh, they, these were like the giants of Arlington Hospital uh, at the time. And, uh, it was such a pleasure to get to know all of them. And the teaching at that time, Dr. Nolan was the uh, internal medicine, um, or the medicine uh, director of clinical medicine here, and uh, uh, so involved with the teaching was Dr. Ryan also. So it was just a natural fit into what I wanted to do in my profession. Looking at the history of the lecture series, um, you know, 30 years ago, there was just so much that was going on. And I just did a little brief, you know, reconnection of 30 years ago, which I was just graduating from high school at the time. But, um, you know, 30 years ago, we listened to Madonna and U2 on our Walkman. Today, we listen to Madonna and U2 on our phone and can tweet and can Twitter and can text at the same time. 30 years ago, we had a travel ban against Haiti and Africa to help prevent the spread of AIDS into this country. It really didn't stop the spread of AIDS, but we did have a travel ban. Today, we have a travel ban also. It doesn't help to stop the spread of terror, as we've seen in New York and Vegas. 30 years ago, Dr. Fauci spoke about AIDS epidemic and at its peak was killing over 35,000 people a year. Today we have Dr. Ben Nordstrom to discuss the opioid epidemic and treatments, which currently is killing 35,000 people a year or more. Dr. Nordstrom, are you Irish? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, but it's all good. Dr. Nordstrom went to undergrad in Minnesota, medical school at Dartmouth. 
He studied and did residency in psychiatry at Columbia University in New York. Went back to receive a doctorate in criminology at University of Pennsylvania. He's published multiple papers on substance abuse and addiction. He's been a professor throughout his postdoctoral work and his training. He's been the vice president an executive vice president of the Phoenix House in New York and involved with the Phoenix House here in Arlington, Virginia, which has helped more than 40,000 patients with addiction and substance abuse. He's here tonight to help us understand more about addiction and the treatment of opioids and options for treatment. I'm happy to present my colleague, Dr. Ben Nordstrom. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'd like to thank a, a number of people. First off, Dr. Cranky for throwing my hat in the ring for me uh, to be considered to give this lecture. Um, I'd like to thank the entire uh, uh, committee for uh, inviting me down, Dory, for helping set up all of the logistics of it, but especially the Dolan family. So thank you for putting this on and for uh, having me down to give this lecture. You know, in, in reading about Dr. Dolan and hearing people talk about him, I have to say he reminds me very much of my grandfather, who was also born in 1913, who was also a doctor, who was a surgeon in World War II, just like Dr. Dolan, um, and who uh, was then a, a chief of staff in a suburban hospital outside of Chicago, though. Um, my family decided that instead of opening a dry goods business in Seattle, we'd quarry limestone outside of Seattle, apparently. So, uh, so we... Um, you know, this overlap between my grandfather and Dr. Dolan, I could just hear my grandfather's voice saying those quotes. Um, I think that they were probably cut very much from the same cloth. And uh, one of the stories that kind of loops back to what we're talking about tonight was when my grandfather retired from his general surgery practice, uh, my dad and my uncle went to help him clean it out, you know, clean out his office. And, you know, there's all kinds of old medical equipment, old medical supplies. And in the back of a closet, they actually found a supply of pharmaceutical grade cocaine um, <laughs> back from the days when it was used to, uh, you know, uh, pack uh, nasal uh, uh, bleeding and things like that. And so my dad and my uncle looked at each other like, what are we supposed to do with this? So uh, they poured it down the toilet, allegedly. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't witness it, but they said they did. Uh, but it takes us to kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is, you know, illicit drugs and what's going on um, with the medical provision of drugs then that have uh, spilled out and become sort of problematic in the larger population. Um, at the end of this, I hope that we've accomplished a couple of goals. I hope that you sort of understand some of the forces that drove the opiate crisis. I want to talk to a little bit about medications that can actually be used to treat um, opioid use disorders. And then lastly, um, I want to talk a little bit about some research that I was part of when I was at Dartmouth, um, th where we actually, uh, much to the point of this lecture, where we educated physicians as a way of um, helping improve the treatment. So we'll start by just talking about a little background data. This is from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And this is a survey that's done on a yearly basis by the federal government, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, um, where they send people out to their, you know, your house and randomize people to uh, participate in a survey where you ask about illicit drugs. And when you ask, as a representative of the federal government at somebody's house, um, in the past month, have you used any drugs that aren't legal? Uh, about 10% of the population says yes. And you can see that most of that is marijuana, it's cannabis products, but right underneath that is misuse of prescription pain relievers, second most common thing that people are doing. Way down at the bottom, you're gonna see heroin. All right, and we're gonna talk a little bit about all the noise about the opioid crisis and, and how to put it into context. But just in case you're wondering what kind of person would answer questions about their drug use uh, to the federal government, that's my 17-year-old daughter. Um, you can see that when they showed up uh, and uh, she participated in NISDA. It was one of my proudest moments as a parent. Uh, and the research assistant grudgingly allowed me to take a picture of it. Um, but so she was part of the, the data that kind of you're seeing here. So this is looking at heroin specifically, and it's looking at uh, in the past year for people over 12. And what you can see is there's a gradual sort of increase. Not dramatic, right? And what you can see here is by these pluses, it means that this year 
is only statistically significantly higher than these years. So it hasn't really changed that much since 2005. Okay, so that's past year use. Did you use any time in the past year? When you look over the past month, um, you know, what you uh, see is, um, oh, this is, the, this is still, uh, oh, this is heroin use disorder. So this is if people actually have a diagnosis of it. So this is people who are using enough that they're actually dependent on it. And what you can see is, again, it's an increase. And in 2015, it's higher than it was in 2007, but it's not this meteoric increase. But we keep hearing all about the opioid crisis. So what is it all about? Is, well, maybe it's about pain relievers. Well, when you look, the pain reliever data are down. NISDA didn't, um, the NISDA didn't even present it as, as a, a line graph this year, but it, it's down. And you can see that 1.2% you know, of the population you know, is, uh, for, of 18 to 25 year olds is, um, uh, has a, a, essentially a diagnosable addiction to the pain relievers. So we've got the opiates, they're up, they're up you know, relative to what they were in the early 2000s, but there's not this meteoric increase, and everyone's talking about the opioid crisis. So what are they talking about? Well, this is overdose deaths, and Dr. Carenti touched on this in his uh, opening remarks. And what you can see is this goes all the way back to 1970, and you can see that there was a little blip here, the French Connection heroin epidemic, and then you can see a little blip here, which was when the crack cocaine um, uh, really became kind of a popular way of taking it in this country, and, and uh, there was a changeover of how co uh, cocaine was being used. But then look what happens after there. Just this huge increase. In 2013, there were 43,000. Last year, there were over 60,000 overdose deaths. So, okay, what's, what's behind that? Well, when you drill down and you look at all the different kinds of drugs, that are part of, that people overdose on. Cocaine's not driving it. You know, the benzodiazepines a little bit, but it's mostly the opioids. Okay, so it's the things like the pain relievers, things like heroin. When you look and you break that apart, what you can see is that the opioid pain relievers were the things that were driving it for the most part, but now you can see heroin really taking off. And this has continued to rise over the past couple of years, especially with the addition of fentanyl um, into the drug supply. And so for the, uh, the trainees in the audience who might be around for the uh, Grand Rounds, tomorrow uh, we're going to be talking about fentanyl and some research that uh, Phoenix House has done um, on the fentanyl issue. So what's happening here? Well, there's an interesting pattern, is what you can see is heroin use by looking at, this is at who's getting admitted into programs. It's mostly younger people, 20 to 34 year olds, and it's mostly white people. They're going up, everybody else is flat or going down. So part of this is that there are people dying and the people who are using heroin and using the opioids, it's a different population that you, than used to use it in the past. And so that's part of what's driving the crisis. It's not just the overdose deaths, it's also that there's a changeover in the population. Now when you look at death rates by overdose from the prescriptions, again, what you can see at, uh, versus heroin, you can see that the heroin overdose really is most common in the 25 to 34 year old age group, but for the opioid pain relievers, the 45 to 50 year old group really is the highest, and, and this increases um, up you know, into middle age and then starts to come down. So these two things are behaving a little bit differently. And when you look at heroin admission by age, again, what you see, um, it's mostly uh, young, younger white people relative to other races. So there's a changeover in who's using heroin. Well, let's look for a minute about some patterns that might explain why this population is suddenly getting sucked into heroin in a way that it didn't before. This is looking at people getting admitted to the hospitals or to treatment programs for treatment of opioid use disorders. And this is specifically not heroin. So what you see is the uh, darker the color, the more that, that are going on. So this is 1999, and you can see that there's some states that are higher than others. 
But now let's just jump forward to 2001. And then we're going to jump forward to 2003. And then we're going to jump forward to 2005. And then we're going to go to 2007. And you can see, especially here in New England and in here in Appalachia, you've got very, very high rates. 2009, all right. So the opioid painkillers started to really have a huge problem with people getting admitted to those programs for treatment of, you know, related to the misuse of those things. And when you look at the number of deaths, the number of opioid deaths, it maps on exactly, essentially, to these are opioid sales. So the more these things are being prescribed, the more people are dying of them. How does that lead or relate to the, the slides we looked at for people getting admitted for treatment? Well, here is opioid sales, there is opioid deaths, and there is opioid treatment. So these things are highly, highly correlated. So as people are being prescribed more opiates, more opiates are going out into the community, more people are getting dependent on them, and more people are uh, seeking treatment for that, and more people are dying from the overdoses from them. All right, so when you look then at the, well, what's the role of prescribing in it? Specifically, how do we think about, how does opioid prescribing drive this? Well, okay, this didn't, can't see this too well, but right here you can see this is uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Minnesota. All right, They're very light colored, and they have these tiny dots. The smaller dot means that those are lower rates of opioid prescribing, and the lighter the blue color means uh, the fewer overdose deaths. Here's Appalachia, where we saw those colors change dark fastest. You can see dark colors, so they have high drug overdose death rates and high amounts of painkiller being sold there. So again, the prescribing patterns is really driving the overdose deaths. Well, what's driving the uh, prescribing of the opioids? Well, this is looking at New York State, all right, and this is looking at milligrams per capita on this side, specifically of oxycodone. And you can see that oxycodone has been around for a long time, it wasn't prescribed that much until around 1996. And right around 1996, something happens, and it just explodes. Okay, well, here's an interesting thing that also kind of maps onto that. And this is the dollars spent marketing OxyContin. And OxyContin is just a form of oxycodone. And it was a form of oxycodone that was still, uh, designed by Purdue Pharmaceuticals and was supposed to be non-abusable. Um, supposed to uh, be slower uh, in absorption and less likely to be abused. And look how much money they started to spend on it starting in year one and then it goes up in year two, year four, year five, and year six, you know. And what is year one for Oxycontin? 1996, right here. So they started advertising that, and advertising works. They got more people to prescribe it, okay? So what was happening, at least in part, and I think that it's really reductionistic to say this is the whole cause of the opioid crisis because it's more than just that. It's more than just this, but this is, a, I think, an important part to bear in mind when we think about um, marketing and we think about having drug, deal ta uh, drug detailers come in and speak to uh, physicians and things like that. But industry was funding this, that the, uh, especially Purdue Pharmaceuticals, was funding a lot of educational activity for people saying, you know, doctors are needlessly afraid of prescribing opioids, that opioids um, really can be safely used in, in the treatment of non uh, non-cancer, chronic pain, just as easily as other things. Uh, they cited a paper uh, by a guy named Portnoy, who was out of New York City, saying that he had, had shown that this to be effective. In fact, the study was a chart review from his private practice, and it was a letter to the editor. It got cited tons and tons of times, especially by the drug detailers, who were saying that this is a really safe and effective thing to do. They said that um, opioid addiction is really, really rare, it doesn't happen in pain patients, that they're very different populations, opioids can be stopped easily, and that they're safe and effective for the treatment of chronic pain. And they had a number of strategies 
to help drive this home, that they uh, talked to like the Joint Commission um, and got the Joint Commission, which is the big accrediting body for hospitals, and got them to include pain as a fifth vital sign. And then uh, all of a sudden, pain and how you were addressing pain becomes part of how you are paid as a hospital system. Are you doing a good job with it? And there's a huge focus on it. And it's not to say that treating pain isn't important, but I think that we also have to think about the motivations of the people funding these movements. Right? And the uh, Federation of State Medical Boards started to put more and more uh, stuff about pain into um, different sorts of licensing exams. And the idea that they were advocating that pain patients and drug abusers are completely different populations turns out not to be necessarily so true. That there are a group of people who do go from being prescribed for completely legitimate reasons who get kind of caught up in it, who get snared in. But the other thing is um, that you know, 35% of the people in pain clinic clinics receiving pain uh, medications meet criteria for an opioid use disorder. So about a third of the people in a pain clinic were gonna show exam you know, exhibit symptoms of actually it becoming a problem for them. So it's not a rare thing. It's not the, it's not the majority of people, but it's a significant minority. 92% um, of the people who died of those opioid overdoses um, were actually being prescribed the opiates, so there's opioid-related harm that can follow. You know, and so the concern is then that you know, you've got these very powerful drugs that are getting out that the other thing we know from the NISDA study, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, is that most of the time that people were getting these opioid pain relievers, they were getting them from a friend or a family for free. They weren't buying them on the street, they weren't doing these things because they were so much sitting in people's cabinets, that there were things sitting in people's uh, medica you know, in, in their uh, window cells or in their bathroom counters, and people were either taking those or being given those, and it was leaking into the community, and that was driving this. And then as people got more and more sort of involved with opioids, what started to happen is heroin is actually a cheaper substitute. You know, and so people switch to using heroin because it saves money because these medications, are, uh, the, buying them on the street is kind of expensive. But here's the interesting thing, right? And this is, again, to get to the point that we don't want to be too reductionistic about this. We can't just lay this at the feet of you know, people over-prescribing or, or trying to find that balance between treating people's pain adequately and having too many of these powerful addictive drugs around. We've been through this before as a country with these, the patent medications. So back in the 1800s, late 1800s, your modal drug user in this, com in this country was an opioid user. And they were mostly uh, either Civil War vets or they were uh, uh, upper middle class women who could afford to get these sorts of medications easily. And these patent medications are just basically alcohol with, opioid so with opium gum solids dissolved into them. Things like laudanum and drugs of those natures. And what was happening is there were so few drugs that were useful. So people, you know, women who had chronic pain from uh, pelvic floor injuries, from traumatic childbirths, and, and Civil War vets who had combat-related injuries, these, the doctors pushed these because they were the only things that worked. They didn't have a lot of therapeutic options. All right, and so here's a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes from the late 1800s. The constant prescription of opiates by certain physicians has rendered the habitual use of that drug in the region very prevalent. A frightful endemic betrays itself in the frequency with which the haggard features and drooping shoulders of the opium drunkards are met with in the street. So this happened before. And that was Oliver Wendell Holmes, MD. He was the dean of Harvard, but I got to point out, he was, before that, he was the dean of Dartmouth. So. <laughs> and so that was your modal drug user in the late 1800s. But again, once something happened, people started to change how they perceive drug users, right? And who is that down to? Well, it's down to these guys. Actual picture of them. And these guys were taking morphine, which is the active alkaloid that's in opium gum. And they had discovered how to put acetyl groups onto, that, onto the morphine molecule. And they had just made a huge fortune 
by putting onto uh, salicylic acid. They put an acetyl group on it and made acetosalicylic acid. And so they said, well, we can do it with morphine too. And they actually put two acetyl groups on it, there and there, and they made diacetylmorphine. But that name wasn't very good in the same way that acetosalicylic acid isn't a very good name. So they called that one aspirin and they named this one heroin. And so Bayer Pharmaceuticals invented and trademarked heroin. And once heroin came to the markets and came to the United States, all of a sudden, not only was the kind of drug being used changed, but who was using the drug changed. And the drug use changed mostly to um, immigrant men who had just come to the country who were living in inner cities. And instead of feeling sorry for drug users, like they did when they were upper middle class women and when they were Civil War vets, drug users became highly stigmatized. And a series of things led to eventually uh, the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 and heroin, which used to be available over the counter, uh, cocaine, which was available over the counter, all those things um, got uh, essentially uh, tightly regulated by the federal government. So we've been here before where we've gone down this road where we use these drugs, it spills over, it creates addiction in, in a group of people who weren't using it before. There's a large kind of mess of uh, legitimate medical, societal, um, and other sort of forces that kind of drive this. And that's where we are again today. And it's hard to unring these bells once they're rung. But there are treatments. So let's talk for a minute about what happens when somebody gets addicted to opioids. Well, tolerance develops very, very quickly. So people take these medications or these drugs and very quickly their body adjusts to it. And they need to take more in order to get the same effect, whether it's a medical effect or whether it's a recreational effect. Um, and then use starts to get perpetuated because of positive reinforcement, because it makes a good feeling come when people use these drugs. They get high, they get a euphoria, they feel good. But it also gets perpetuated if it makes a bad feeling go away. And that bad feeling could be pain, or it could be, um, you know, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm bored, and the drug makes that kind of unpleasant feeling state go away. Then, what happens, um, you got this positive reinforcement and then this negative reinforcement. And what happens is as people use and as they get more tolerant, eventually they get to the point where if they don't take the drug, they go into withdrawal. And the withdrawal state is unpleasant. It hurts, it doesn't feel good. And so then they take the drug and it makes that go away. And now they're caught between the positive reinforcement of needing it to feel good and then the negative reinforcement of needing it just not to feel bad. And they get caught in this pincer group, or this pincer movement, and they feel, uh, they're, they're, they just get stuck. So, what can be done about it? Well, there are actually medications that can help. So we'll talk very briefly about the kinds of medications that can be done. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about is medications called full agonists. And full agonists go to that receptor that heroin works at, that opioids work at, in the brain is called, for the purpose of our conversation, we're gonna limit it and just talk about the mu receptor. And when it binds there, it turns that receptor on. You know, and these are the same receptors we have in our brains you know, uh, for uh, endorphins, for our own, uh, our own sort of brain's natural painkillers. And so those drugs bind to that receptor, that endorphin receptor, and they, they crank it on. And the more you give of the drug, the bigger effect you get. So, you know, to think about this, um, you give them these drugs, turns it on, the more you give, the more you get. So the example that I give for kind of what this is like, it's like a race car. Okay, so if you think about a race car, you step down on the accelerator, it's got fast acceleration, the harder you press down, the faster you go. You know, you keep pushing on the accelerator, you're gonna go faster and faster. Now there might, there's a theoretical maximum to the system, but it's really, really fast. And basically all of the abused opioids are full agonists. We'll contrast that by talking about the partial agonists, which are slightly different. The partial agonists 
when you give those, you get an effect. And when you give more, you get a little bit more of an effect. But really quickly, you get this, you kind of max out the system. So if the full agonists are a race car, the partial agonists, I think, are more like this. A U-Haul with a speed governor on it, if you've ever driven one of those. So you step on the accelerator, you start moving. You step on it harder, well, you know, zero to 60 in about three and a half minutes. You know? And then if you floor it, you're not going faster than 55 or 60 miles an hour because it's got the speed governor on it. It's got the restrictor plate. So no matter what you do, you're not going faster than that. Not a race car. That's a little bit different from the antagonists, which also bind to those receptors, but the antagonists don't do anything. They just bind to the receptor. They just stop something else from going there. So if you think about it, like an antagonist is like chewing up gum and pushing it into a lock. It's not gonna lock or unlock the door. All it does is it stops the key from going in there to lock or unlock the door. But if we go with the car analogy that we were going with, uh, and I, we might be too far south. Um, but that's what this is, okay? And this is from up where I used to live in Philadelphia, where when it snows, you dig out your parking spot, and then you put something there so that nobody takes your parking spot because you spent all the time shoveling it out. So that's not a car. You're not going anywhere if you sit in those chairs. All it does is stop a car from going there, and that's what the antagonists do. And if you ever want to see a Philadelphian really mad, move those chairs and put your car there. <laughs> Guaranteed problem. <laughs> so when you think about this on a dose response curve, what do these things actually look like? Well, this is efficacy. So you can think about this as high drug effect, and this is low drug effect. And this is basically dose. So this is low dose and high dose. So when you give a low dose of a full agonist, you get an effect. You go up a little on the dose, Look, you get a much higher effect. There's your, your steep takeoff. That's your fast acceleration. The more you give, the more you get. You hit some theoretic maximum, you know, theoretical maximum of the system, but that's like the race car. When you really put the hammer down on it, it's flying. Here's your antagonist. This is your stuff like your naloxone, your Narcan, your reversal agents, the things that kind of bring people back to life, or people, you know, there's another drug called Vivitrol that can be given, um, that help, that all that does, it binds to those receptors, stops people from getting high. That's all it does, it doesn't do anything um, on the other side of it. And here is your partial agonist. And there you see, you give a higher dose, you get a little bit more of an effect. You go up a little higher, you get a little bit more of an effect. But then look what happens. You flatten out really early on. And then that is the restrictor plate effect. That's the U-Haul uh, only going 55 miles an hour. So the drugs that we use that follow these, this is methadone. So methadone is a full agonist. Buprenorphine is the partial agonist. And like we talked about, Narcan, Naloxone, and Vivitrol, those are the antagonists. So what these are really good at is just turning the drug off. They just bind to it, take up the spot so the drug can't bind to that receptor. And that's how you can give it as a reversal agent to people to, start, to stop breathing, you know, if they've stopped breathing, to get it to go again. The other thing you can do is you can give them a long-acting form of it. And then if they use, the drug can't get to their brain, doesn't get to the receptor, and it just stops them from getting high. All it does is stop the positive reinforcement. It doesn't do anything about withdrawal. It doesn't do anything about preventing withdrawal. But it's still a really useful drug. These two, because they work at the receptor, well, they can stop the positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement. They do it slightly differently. Methadone stops people from going into withdrawal because it just lasts a long time. You take it once a day, it sticks around in your, your body, you don't go into withdrawal, you don't need to take heroin just to not go into withdrawal. That's the great thing about methadone. It also stops people from getting high, but you gotta push the dose up. And what that is basically, it's like if you had no money in your bank account and somebody gives you $100, you're like, Yahtzee, I got $100, this is great, you feel it. If you have $10,000 in your bank account and somebody gives you $100, you don't notice it, right? Because you've got $10,000 sitting there. So by the same token, when you put somebody on methadone and increase their dose, 
It's like putting money into their bank account. So then if they go out and they find, buy whatever, heroin, and they use it, it's like giving $10 to somebody with $10,000 in their bank account. It just doesn't move the needle. They don't feel it, and then they stop spending their money on it. You essentially make them so tolerant that you price them out of the heroin market. And that's how methadone works. Buprenorphine works slightly differently. It actually binds to that receptor so tightly that if you use heroin or you use other painkillers, you, you don't, that it can't get rid of it. It doesn't knock it off that receptor. It just stays there. But it keeps you locked in at kind of this low level as opposed to a higher level of receptor activation. So that means it's a little safer to use, hard to overdose on it. Methadone, you can overdose on it. So this is a little bit less risky, especially to give in a doctor's office. So buprenorphine, this is you know what it does. It binds to that receptor. It stays there for a long time. People don't go into withdrawal. If they use when they're on it, they can't feel it, and they basically stop doing it. I mean, any time I've ever put somebody on buprenorphine, and I've put tons of people on buprenorphine, eventually they come back and they've tried it. They tried to see if they could feel heroin while they were on it. And they say, oh, yeah, I spent $40, I spent $100. And I said, whoa, well, did you feel anything? And they said, oh, I think so, maybe. It turns out people aren't going to spend $40 to $100 for, I don't think so, maybe. You know, that's just, it's not worth their time, so they stop using it. This is um, essentially what it looks like, what buprenorphine does in the brain. So this top line, these are all detox, or th these are all controlled subjects. So these are all basically uh, grad students um, who uh, agreed to be given uh, essentially a radioactive version of an opiate. And so that radioactive version of the opiate goes to all the open binding sites, all those mu receptors we talked about, and just sits there. And so you see those warm colors that means that there's open sites there. There's an open man in the field. Everything down here, these are all detoxified users who are then given a dose of buprenorphine. So at first, they gave them a placebo dose and did the same thing. They gave them the radioactive uh, opiate. And you can see tons of open men in the field. Nothing's blocked. Lots of opportunity for that opiate to bind. You put them on two milligrams of buprenorphine, and look what happens. The buprenorphine is sitting there on those open receptors, closing them up, and then that radioactive opiate has nowhere to bind. You put them on 16 milligrams, they're over 90% blocked. So 16 milligrams will block people about 90%. This is just another study that kind of looks at this, what happens when you give people different doses of buprenorphine, and then give them, in this case, uh, they're giving them dilaudid hydromorphone, and they're asking them, how high do you feel before they give the drug? And then they say, now how, do you, how high do you feel after they give the dilaudid? And so when somebody's on a placebo dose of buprenorphine, there's a big change in those scores, huge change in the score. They really feel it when they're on a placebo dose of buprenorphine, and you give them dilaudid, they totally know it. You put them on two milligrams, they still feel it. You put them on 16 milligrams, and then you give them dilaudid, they barely feel anything. They don't know if they felt anything. Now here's the interesting thing. You go up to 32 milligrams, it's no different. And that's that restrictor plate effect. You're over 90% bound, you go over 16 milligrams, you just don't get any, you're not going any faster. You can put the hammer down on it, you're about as blocked as you're gonna get, no additional effect. So, you know, we'll just skip over that one and go to this. So there is this very effective treatment for the treatment of opioid use disorders in, in buprenorphine. Now the big difference between methadone and buprenorphine is because buprenorphine is less abusable, because it is safer, instead of having to go to a methadone clinic the way that people do in order to get methadone, you can actually get buprenorphine from your private doctor in a doctor's office or your nurse practitioner or physician's assistant now. Thankfully, they've managed, they've changed the law so that, because it's not that complicated a medication. I don't know why that wasn't the case from the, the beginning. So, you know, so we've got these effective medications um, that can be done out of a doctor's office, but here's the thing, um, people weren't doing it. Even when this uh, opioid uh, crisis was really kicking off and we had all these new users, all these new users in places where you can't have methadone clinics really, because I used to work in rural New England and I can tell you, you've got a lot of poor people who are addicted to opiates and they live on dirt roads 
an hour or two hours from the nearest clinic, they're not driving to a clinic every day for a dose. It's not practical. They're not spending four hours round trip. And even if they could spend that time, they don't have vehicles that are reliable. And even if they did have vehicles that are reliable, the roads aren't reliable, especially in the winter. And so it's not a good solution, but still we couldn't get people to do it. So there's a huge gap between people having buprenorphine, um, even though it's proven, and being able to get it to people. It's an underutilized treatment. It's been shown repeatedly, repeatedly. Um, the median number of patients being treated by doctors who have the waivers to do buprenorphine was 10. Legally, you could do 30. Um, the median number was 10. So the people who were doing this weren't treating that many patients. Um, the more barriers that the doctors thought they perceived led to fewer people uh, on buprenorphine. And the barriers were really lack of experience in treating addictions. This is looked at as a very niche field. Um, you know, to the point in the video about, uh, I don't know anything about OB. Well, you're a doctor, aren't you? Get over there. People don't feel that way about addictions. They, they don't want to touch it if they don't know anything about it. And then also there's these concerns about just the logistics of how do I do buprenorphine. When you increase people's knowledge, you see decreased barriers and more prescribing. So talk for a minute now about learning collaboratives. And learning collaboratives are essentially an evidence-based treatment or an evidence-based intervention to teach providers about how to do something in medicine with a new skill, a new process, a new something. Um, they bring together experts and practitioners. There's a mix of face-to-face -face encounters and then also things that are like either webinars or telephone calls, things like that. And it's not just uh, giving a lecture. There's a sharing of information. The practices present their data. They learn from each other. The uh, experts learn about what's actually happening in the field. And the information moves in, uh, in all directions. And this has been shown to be an effective um, uh, way of changing uh, clinical behavior. So, as a lot of you know, um, Vermont developed a pretty significant heroin problem uh, after all of this, kind of the, these patterns unrolled in front of them. And the state had a number of things that they wanted. They approached us and said, can you help us do learning collaboratives around teaching people how to do buprenorphine? Because we got to get more people in care. We can't just do more methadone clinics. It's not going to work in Vermont. We need more of this office-based opioid treatment. Help us figure it out. And what they really wanted was to improve buprenorphine care, to reduce practice variation, so to get all the practices kind of behaving in the same way, so you didn't have some doctors who were giving out tons and it was spilling over and getting diverted into illicit economies. Um, they wanted um, to increase fidelity to guidelines and they said, eventually, we want to increase the number of patients who are on buprenorphine, but we don't want to increase the number of patients who are on buprenorphine until we start doing it correctly in Vermont. So we were brought in, and so we started doing things, and we uh, did an analysis of sort of the barriers and facilitators um, of the different, uh, different things in the way of being able to do this. So the barriers um, of the intervention you know, you've got to get special permission from the DEA to do this. Um, once you start doing it, I can tell you the DEA comes and visits you a couple times a year. And so for a lot of doctors, having guys with badges and guns uh, show up and sit them down can freak people out. Um, the good thing about uh, the faci that facilitated using buprenorphine was that the state of Vermont was very committed to this. They wanted to make it happen. The outer setting. Barriers are the, we have a very poor, po poor population, a rural population, huge opioid problem there. The facilitators, Vermont was one of the states that, one of the first states to expand Medicaid. So people actually had insurance that would pay for this. Um, the office-based kind of settings, um, the barriers were staff attitudes. Staff didn't want to deal with these patients, these patients. Um, but a great thing about uh, those teams though, they had a very strong team ethic, that they were, they worked well together. They, you know, they had their uh, prescriber, they had their nurse, they had their office staff, and they all got along. And then when you look at the, the prescribers themselves, the barriers was a lack of perceived backup. 
and really trying to look at the emotional sustainability of working with these populations and facilitators where you have people who are just committed to their towns in rural New England. So we did these learning collaboratives with them, with the Department of Vermont Health Access, um, another group called the Blueprint for Health, which is basically Vermont Medicaid. Um, and they were interested in doing this, and they'd done them previously for asthma and diabetes. So they'd done this before. So what they really wanted us to do is pull it together, essentially a focus group of stakeholders across the state, and we said, well, what are the things that you think we really need to focus on? What are the things that we need to do to improve, you know, given that the state wants us to improve the standard of care? And what they came up with, they wanted people who are getting this medication to actually have a diagnosis of an opioid use disorder. It found it, there was a big study that was done in uh, Pennsylvania, and they found that up to 30% of the people who were getting uh, buprenorphine were not uh, even diagnosed with an opioid use problem, necessarily. And so then the question is, well, are they just taking that medication and selling it? They're taking up treatment spots. You know, um, what's going on with that? Um, the other thing was people weren't checking urine drug screens. So they weren't looking to see, was, was this medication helping? Was it being used correctly? Um, were people actually just continuing to use opiates on top of this? Um, were they doing other things? Um, there was a lot of concern about dose because what people find out is uh, most people, not all people, 16 milligrams is a really good dose for them because like we talked about, that's where the that's where that restrictor plate kicks in. But a lot of people were getting more than that who didn't necessarily need it, and so they were selling that. And they were selling it in these towns, and then the problem is the local police find out about it, the local police and the local town then want to shut down doctors who are doing this, and so we had to kind of try to figure out how to regulate it, how to get people feedback on the dose so that they're, um, they're not using too much. And then we also wanted them to see unstable patients more frequently, to check the prescription monitoring system, and then we wanted to look at retention and treatment and whether or not they were getting um, the co-occurring treatment for mental health conditions. So we invited 28 practices, and of those, 24 completed every single session. Of those that came to every single session, um, or that, actually, this, of, of those who came to any of the sessions, 22 of them shared data. So 92% of the practices came and showed data so that they, we could figure out how we're going to improve. And so we would do a lecture. We would go and we would look at the data. They'd come up with different uh, ways that we could try to improve their practice. And this is what we saw over time. This is uh, the number of, uh, the, the percent of the practice that actually had a diagnosed opioid use disorder. They started out at about 62.3%, and this is a statistically significant result. At the end, it was 87.5. The odds ratio was like 2.5 for that. So the other thing I point out is look what happens. This is your, essentially your spread. As we went on, the spread got less and less. So we saw reduced practice variation and improved performance. For seeing unstable patients weekly, started out at 47.9%, and in the end it was 66%. Again, a, a statistically significant improvement, but look at again what happened to the spread. So what you could see is as these groups came together, not only were they statistically improving their performance, but they were also getting on the same page. And there was starting to be a real consensus around how you do buprenorphine in Vermont. Looking at dose, this is the number of people who are on more than 16 milligrams. Um, it started out at 10% and went down to uh, about 8%. Looking at the number of uh, urine drug screens, started out at 70, um, done at least monthly, started out about 71% and ended at 88%. Statistically significant again. And, so, and again, you see that, re that reduced practice variation. So, and then checking the state prescription monitoring system. Um, that increased from 32% all the way up to 72%. And reduced practice variation as we went. This one didn't change. This was not statistically significant for people getting into uh, specialty co-management. But again, you see that there's reduced practice variation around it. 
And for people who were being retained in care for at least six months, that didn't change that much. But again, um, the practice variation came down. Now, interesting thing was, even though this wasn't something we were planning on, the number of patients who were prescribed did go up. That the, the practices, as they felt more comfortable with this, started to let more people in to do this with them. It's not a statistically significant rise, but it did continue to go, uh, to go on and on. So I think one of the take-homes from it is that these kinds of educational events really are important because they really do change people's practice and that there really is this opportunity for things like the Dolan uh, lecture series where you can bring people in and you can, because the people who are in medicine are trying to do the right thing, and when you bring a kind of a challenging program, uh, problem in front of these practitioners, and you put your heads together and you look at the data and you look at the science and you look at what's out there and you share that, not only do you improve your performance, you reduce sort of the disparities in the population, and then you can actually meet the challenges that are facing you at the community level, at the state level, or nationally. So these are the names of everybody who helped us out. I want to thank, again, Dr. Crenti, the entire uh, committee, the Dolan family. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, and I really appreciate your attention. Thanks. If you have a question, there's mics, microphones. They can be circulated. Um, Yeah, it, I mean, it is really incredible. And when you think about it, it's not only 200 million prescriptions. Um, the United States has 4% of the world's population. We consume 80% of the world's opiates. Right. So there's something that is out of whack, right? Um, and it, 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 I mean, it, and it's a really challenging thing because there are problems with people not having pain taken seriously. And so there's a balance there, right? And I think that that's the problem is what we frequently do in this country is the, the pendulum swings, and it swings too far. And I think that when we looked at addressing pain, it kind of sw it swung too far. And now they're doing things in different municipalities, like limiting the number of um, Medicaid, uh, uh, the, the length of prescriptions that are coming out of emergency rooms, limiting the uh, length of prescriptions coming out of different dental procedures or after different surgical procedures. You know, that, um, that Sure, yeah, and one of the things that, um, you know, and so I was part of a CDC working group where we really uh, put, came together with and got some ideas about what can be done around this, around having good opioid contracts with people, checking urine drug screens, assessing risk for um, addiction before you start prescribing this. So if you've got somebody who's at a higher risk where you know going into it that this is a person who is more likely to get tripped up by this, that you're going to be more careful. You know, and I think though that some of the real basic stuff, um, one of the things I, you know, whenever community members are present, is don't keep opioids in your house. Right? I have two teenagers, and they're good kids. I mean, she took the test, right? Um, we don't leave opioids in the house. We don't leave controlled substances in the house because they're good kids, but they're kids. And their friends are good kids. I don't know about our friends so much, but, but they're still kids, you know? Um, and so I think that making sure that those things go to drop boxes, that they, they go to those give backs, to get them out, because we know that that's a really critical way that they get, they leach into the population, and it starts this whole process off. Oh, sure. Oh, I, I don't know, Dor Dory's running that. There's someone behind you. Dr. Morrison, could you speak a little bit about the management of an infant going through opioid withdrawal and the management of it? Sure. So, you know, historically, when a when, uh, mother is uh, exposed to uh, opioids while they're pregnant, the baby will go into, um, will have some element of withdrawal frequently um, because the baby is physically dependent on it just the way that the mother is physically dependent on it. The baby will have withdrawal symptoms. And for the longest time, methadone was what was available. It was what was available for the mothers while they're pregnant because uh, you know that 
we know that if uh, a woman goes into opiate withdrawal, it theoretically increases her risk for preterm labor. And so you don't want them to go into opiate withdrawal at all. And so we know that methadone could be safe and effective uh, in pregnancy, but then when that baby's born, it's gonna go into withdrawal too. Um, and then, so what would have to happen is that the baby would be given an opiate, whether it's morphine or whether it's methadone, you know, that they would give the babies little doses to try to control it. Um, a study was done called the Mother Study that actually looked at using buprenorphine. And buprenorphine was really, um, what they found is mothers who were on buprenorphine, even though there's not as much safety data because it hasn't been around as long as methadone's been around, um, that, that mothers who were on um, buprenorphine, their babies had less withdrawal than the mothers who, uh, than the mothers who were on methadone or on nothing. You know, and so uh, buprenorphine is, a, even though ACOG up until, really, I haven't looked in the past year, I think, but up until recently, methadone was considered the gold standard. Um, uh, but buprenorphine is something that is used. Um, when I was at Dartmouth, we started actually a maternal clinic to, uh, where we worked um, with nurse practitioner, uh, nurse midwives from our um, OB department and got, um, got pregnant opioid addicted women onto, uh, onto buprenorphine and then follow them through. Um, I'm actually referring to the treatment of the baby. Okay. The mother hasn't had any treatment. Yeah, so there's different scoring for the babies. Um, we, interesting stuff about the scoring, because babies don't have a lot of sophisticated ways to sort of voice disapproval or to express themselves. And so the scoring kind of comes down to things like, is the kid shaking? Are they um, inconsolable? Different things like that. They can also look at some of the objective signs of withdrawal. What they found is that the, the more the nurse who's scoring the baby, the more their attitudes um, are uh, sympathetic towards opiate addicts, the less those scores are. So that, that essentially the more negatively a nurse feels about the mother, the more she perceives drug-related distress in the baby. So attitude comes into it. But then after that, you know, basically they do opioid replacement with the babies and they just do small tapering doses to make the baby comfortable and get them through. And how would people learn more about that protocol with a small tapering? So um, that's all done in like neonatal ICUs. Um, we uh, uh, a good um, uh, Bonnie Whelan is a good name to look at. Whelan. Yeah, W H E L A N. Thanks. Is cost for these medications a barrier for the uninsured? So. Uh, so the question is, is cost a barrier? So it certainly has been historically um, that initially when um, buprenorphine came out uh, as, a, as a Schedule three drug that was approved for the you know, sublingual dosing for opioid use disorders, one company had uh, a trademark on it. It was Racket Benkheiser. Um, and you know, they were doing a lot to try to you know, kind of scholarship with it. Um, a number of competitors have emerged, but really what's the biggest thing that's happened is the buprenorphine only form went generic, and then the buprenorphine and suboxone together form went generic, and so that got a lot cheaper. But the other thing that's happened is basically all Medicaid's will approve this because it really is a big cost saver. We talked with a major insurer because the people who have opioid use disorders cost a ton of money. One ambulance ride, one trip to an emergency room costs a ton of money. And the, what the insurers learned is that getting people this medication saves tons. To the point where we had one major insurer tell us that a person with an opioid use, when they looked at their opioid uh, use disorder population that they cover, and they looked at the group that had that diagnosis who got buprenorphine versus the ones who didn't. And those who got it, it could mean one prescription in a year. $28,000 cheaper to treat over the course of a year than those who didn't get it. So the insurance companies became highly incentivized very quickly to make that medication available, even at you know, uh, the, the prices that it was costing to fill a month supply. It still makes a ton of sense. It's still very, very cost effective relative to untreated people. And, you know, that the, when you look at the cost effectiveness, I've seen stuff out a couple of years. It remains cost effective for about two years out, three years out, and I haven't seen data longer than that. 
Um, and certainly methadone has also been shown to be cost effective as well, um, just because it stops overdose, it stops uh, a lot of risk behaviors. The other big place where it saves money is on crime and criminal justice. Thanks very much for your talk. I had a question about um, sort of initiatives that might be carried out at the level of you know, medical school, residency. Um, I think back to how I was trained how to prescribe narcotics, and I would say basically I wasn't trained. Like, yeah. You know, you learn from the residents uh, ahead of you, and you know, somebody passed you a prescription pad, and you looked over and said, well, you prescribed 40, you know, I'll prescribe 40. And that's right. how you learn. Are there, are there initiatives at that level now? So there are. There are a lot of initiatives, again, at the sort of the state licensing level of uh, opioid education. Um, you know, and, I mean, it, so in order to renew a license or to get a license, that there's a certain amount of the CMEs that have to be dedicated specifically to opioid prescribing. So that's something that's catching on more and more. At the medical student level, I was actually part of a group um, that was funded through the Betty Ford Foundation, where we um, created uh, a web-based curriculum uh, for people to be able to do um, case-based learning about addiction. And so medical schools, because the problem is there's not a lot of people who are interested in treating addictions. There's not a lot of addiction specialists. And so there's not a lot of people in medical schools available to do those kinds of lectures who have that expertise. And so what we did with the Betty Ford Foundation was created a web-based course so that medical students could, or medical schools could essentially just get a subscription to it, and then they have a plug-and-play curriculum so that they could just, in the same way that there's a, a you know, there's a, a, a family medicine cases that are done, uh, FM cases, there's a, uh, it's all done through the MedU platform um, where you can get these, uh, you can get this curriculum specifically for medical schools for that reason. Um, Tom McClellan, when he was the assistant uh, drug czar, the, uh, the deputy for demand reduction for ONDCP, really worked very hard to get um, the USMLE, uh, like step three, to include more questions about addiction, because if, they, if it wasn't gonna get fed back to the schools, that their students were passing those, he didn't think that they'd, they'd make curricular room for addiction. And so he fought very hard to make sure that the USMLE had to put more addiction-related questions into it to force that. It was like a forcing function to get addiction into the curriculum. So it's, it, it, people recognize that, and so they're working on it. It's a great question. What, what are the mechanics of prescribing this? Is this one pill a day for 30 days, one pill a day for 365 days? Or? So that's a great question. So the mechanics of prescribing it when you're doing Suboxone with somebody, it's a little tricky to get them on it sometimes because if you give it too soon, you can actually put them into withdrawal because you can imagine if you're driving at race car speeds and then you take something that makes a restrictor plate appear on your engine, you're gonna feel like you locked up the brakes. And so you've gotta let people go into a little bit of withdrawal and then you slowly start it up. Once they're on it, it's a once a day medication. It really, for the vast majority of people, it's just a once a day medication. And you essentially dispense the amount that's commensurate with their level of clinical stability. So if somebody is really, really new and they have just stopped using, you might see them back, you might give them a day or two's worth of medication, and then they come back and you give them another day or two. It might be that you give them a week. And when somebody's really, really stable and they're doing great, you might give them a month's worth. You know, after they've been, uh, you know, really demonstrated stability and you're checking their urines and they're in treatment, um, then you can go, you can see them less frequently. Beyond that, you know, that there's, there's, that's still kind of getting worked out. My personal feeling is that uh, you want people coming in fairly regularly to be checked, um, and that it would be a small minority of patients who would be appropriate to be seen less than monthly. Um, it, sh it shouldn't be a huge number in anyone's practice. But the really important thing to remember about these medications is you'll see it referred to as medication-assisted treatment. And that's what it is. It's not medication treatment. It's not medication instead of treatment. What the medication is supposed to do is allow people to get into treatment. So it should always be part of a larger plan to teach people about addiction to help them get into actual recovery. Because these medications have been shown to reduce the amount of opiates that people use. It's been shown to retain people in treatment. Um, 
but to really help them get into meaningful recovery, change their relationships, change the way that they deal with stress, change uh, who they hang out with, change how they deal with uh, high risk situations. You need treatment to do that. And so that these medications really do, they're just drama reduction agents to give people essentially the brain space to go in and get into treatment. Is there an end point uh, or is this a kind of a lifetime so that's a great question, and this is like the, just the absolute shocking thing to have to admit, is that there's, no, there's not a good answer in the scientific research. The federal government guidance is that people should be on for two years, for methadone, and for buprenorphine people say one to two years. Um, there are no good data that, sort of, that undergird that. That there is a study from 1976 that's a case control study of people who did well after methadone and people who did poorly after methadone. And what they found was the people who did well were in for at least two years, and that's the only real data that we have to, to support that. You know, a 40-year-old case control study. It's awful. I tried to write a grant with uh, the guy I did this with to look at different maintenance times and then taper people off. We were told it was not scientifically interesting enough. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Oh, sure. So that's a good question. So the question is when somebody gets uh, a medication and they have that, that it can affect their mood or it can affect um, you know, getting uh, suicidal and things like that. So people don't, there's, I, I don't think that there's one good answer to this. Um, and certainly, there is a very robust literature about um, opioid receptors and opioid either, um, uh, either agonists or antagonists. And they can have very strong effects on mood. They can have very strong effects on mood. Now, you'll see everything in the literature from people getting antagonists and becoming manic or hypomanic to people getting these medications and getting better from depression, people getting on these medications and going into depression. So it's probably going to be a really complicated answer about a person's specific genetics. And that it's going to, but we know that these things do something to move. And we know that too, that the opioids um, can have some effect on a person's likelihood for a small group of people. It can, it can uh, uh, interact with psychosis or their likelihood of becoming psychotic. Um, so there's lots, it's probably it comes down to individual genetic variation. Uh, my question really focuses on not just uh, its use for opiates, but has been looked at research for this use of other kinds of addiction. So has buprenorphine been looked at in other addictions? For other kinds of addictive behavior. We started talking about the mental health aspects of certain yep. other kinds of addictive behavior. So it has, and that, that it, you know, that it was looked at. It hasn't really shown much. I mean, it was looked at. Somebody looked at it for cocaine, and there wasn't a good, uh, a big signal for it that it really seemed to work. Um, you know, the the interesting thing about buprenorphine is just the way that buprenorphine is a partial agonist at the mu receptor. They came up with a partial agonist at the nicotine receptor, and that's called Chantix or varenicline. And so that's an anti, so that same concept has been applied, but not the same drug. That this is really, it, it does give you very opiate specific results. I was thinking that you see that's some blood. Yeah, so, that, so Chantix does just that. Now they looked at naltrexone for all kinds of different things. Naltrexone is actually effective for drinking. So that's just the blocker, a pure blocker. Um, naltrexone is FDA approved for treatment of alcohol use disorders. So it does work for drinking. Um, when they actually, then they tried it and said, well, maybe it'll work for marijuana. Under double-blind conditions, they found that people who are on naltrexone actually rated uh, uh, marijuana as more pleasurable <laughs> than <laughs> what they did. So they dropped that. I have two questions. Um, sure one. Uh, concerning the overdose, is there any data that who goes from being an opioid user to being somebody who's, yes, over an overdose? that there's any risk factors that, you know, that they've identified to prevent the overdose death when you have an opioid um, use um, disorder. The other question I have is, is there anything in the pipeline such as 
or drug or something that would have the same opioid action on pain but not lead to, to the addiction? Is it possible to have a drug or is there something being developed that could have the same action without the addiction? So that's a great question. So um, to answer the first question first, which is just the, about what increases somebody's likelihood of dying of an overdose, um, uh, Medical comorbidities, especially pulmonary disease, uh, polypharmacy, and the co-administration of other uh, CNS uh, depressants, so especially benzodiazepines. Those are the those are the really really big ones. Um, to answer the other question, yes, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the drug, but again, so there's lots of things that have looked really promising in rodent studies, and there was a study that came out about a year ago about a new drug that was. Um, used in, in rodents. Uh, it was perfectly effective for treating pain, but it didn't do what's called develop condition place preference, where it's, a, it's kind of a quick and dirty test for how addictive a drug is in, in animal settings, where you um, give them the, the drug in like a, a cage with a checkered floor. Um, and then if you find out that they're always hanging out on that checkered floor, you know, you can kind of say like, oh, they've made this association that they want that drug, and so they figured out they gotta sit here in order to get it, and so they're gonna wait for it. So that they found there is a drug, I'm just blanking on the name, but I can tell you that there are lots and lots of things in addiction that look promising in animal models that just don't carry themselves through. Even in non-treatment human settings, they can look promising. You bring them into the treatment world, and they just, they just lose steam dramatically. Well, Doctor, thank you very much for taking part. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks again. This is a mandatory ceremony that you have to go through. Uh, we have an award that was made by Dr. Haggerty that is, he actually has his picture, and there's one man left at the Ann Cain Trophy that can make this trophy at the third year. So you may be the last. That, uh, well, I, thank you so much. It's beautiful. Thank you.